here from Edmonton. So let's give another round of applause for taking that four hour round. So um, I'm going to, I'm here to talk about Libra SSL. How many of you have actually heard of that before? Oh, Most people are. Just because, of, okay. because of the top. Just because of what? Because of the top. Oh, because of the top. Okay. <laughs> oh, the top. So anyway. Um, the top line, not. Yeah, the top line. Okay. Before today. Uh, of course, uh, you've heard of OpenSSL. You've heard of Park Lead. You've heard of all that good stuff. And so I'm going to go into a little bit of what we've seen as a result of that and, and what LibreSSL is, how it came into existence, why we decided to do it, and uh, good stuff like that. So uh, a little bit about me. This is what I am. Question? Yeah. What's the significance of that first slide? Oh, the significance. Does anybody recognize the, what it is? The Jurassic, Jurassic Park. Park. Jurassic Park. Yes, and it's the Jurassic. Scatologist. The scatologist. And so yes, that's uh, lovely. That's lovely Laura Dern up to her arms with gloves in a large pile of shit. And um, I'm not as pretty as Laura Dern, but well, you know that kind of describes. You'll find out why that slide is the way it is. So what does the pile represent? The pile represents OpenSSL. Sure. <laughs> I've been, have been wearing a lot more long sleeve shirts, you know. Yeah. Um, so, about me, I'm a consultant, software developer, uh, nerd herder. Um, I get involved in anything that is fun and people want to pay me money for. Um, so. I've been, uh, and like I said, I'm not quite an original. Uh, I didn't, wasn't around for the very first release of OpenBSD. At the time, I was working on some other software I was fooling with, but I needed another node on the network. Uh, I had a, a cast-off SparkStation One Plus uh, that would let me do what I had, if only I could get a workable operating system and compiler on it. And uh, so I tried to install NetBSD on it, and it blew up spectacularly. And I swore at it for a bit, looked around the net, found OpenBSD, said, geez, this is out of Calgary, and proceeded to install it. It worked. Read on the web page, which the time said, if you like this, this is a good number to phone, which was a pizza place somewhere in Ramsey. And I, you know, <laughs> to put it how old that was, I tried to order a pizza with my credit card from Edmonton, and that was too weird to order a pizza with a credit card. So then I phoned Theo, gave him shit over that, and mm -hmm. therefore ruined my life. Um, I always want to be a lumberjack. Uh, anyway, I'm also a foundation director for the OpenBSD Foundation. The OpenBSD project works as essentially two pieces. There's the project, uh, Theo is, is uh, essentially in charge of that. Uh, it's sort of a benign or anarcho-syndicalist commune with benign dictatorship, or, or less than benign dictatorship as you might say, but it works for us. Um, and then the, the foundation is effectively separate, it's a fundraising entity that uh, makes sure we can go out there and act as a legal entity to raise funds and uh, provide support for the projects that we want to work on and, and stuff to do. So that's, that's me. Um, and what's LibreSSL? So LibreSSL is about 30, I, I, actually, I, I'm reusing the slides. It's about a 40 day old um, <laughs> fork of, of OpenSSL. So we forked it from OpenSSL 1.01G, which was the latest, which is the latest um, stable release of OpenSSL. Uh, and it's being worked on extensively by a lot of OpenBSD developers. So a bunch of people looked at this, and we are kind of we've taken what we usually did, and we've you know kind of set it aside, and we've been working a little bit at that, but we've been primarily focused at uh, getting openness, uh, getting uh, LibreSSL into a, a shape that we are. Let's I wouldn't I don't know if I want to say proud of it, but. Uh, um, we throw up when we when we open it up and look at it, look at the code. We throw up in our mouth and laugh. <laughs> That's really where we're trying to get. So, um, but a little bit about that, and this is kind of geared towards to all of us. And when I say all of us, I mean people like me and Theo and Linus Torvalds and all the FreeBSD guys and absolutely everybody who commits to an open source operating system, or even better yet, the people inside of Apple, Google, everywhere else that use OpenSSL, okay? And that's everybody, okay? And basically everybody out of Microsoft, everybody except Microsoft. So why did we let OpenSSL get so bad? 
And I'll, I'll get into how bad it is. I mean, if you've looked at any background on the heart bleed bug, it's pretty bad. Okay? But why did we let it happen? Essentially, nobody looked. Okay? Or that's not true. A lot of us looked. And a lot of us looked, and we said, well, we've imported this, and it's been getting cruftier and cruftier and cruftier over the last 10 or 15 years. And then you go look at it, and you go, oh, I just want to do my stuff. I, I hope the upstream is dealing with it. I don't want to do, look at this. It's just too awful. I know nothing, literally. Okay? Well, but why did nobody look? It's important. It's software that the inner security of the internet depends on. Okay? Yeah. I read a thing that said claimed that the NSA knew about heart I... If the, I, I don't know if the NSA claims it or doesn't claim it. Uh, I refuse to believe that the NSA doesn't hire people who would be smart enough to look at that. Go, when they see how disgusting that is, they will get paid to wade through the crap. The rest of us are not paid to wade through that crap. Look, they were exploiting it as a point. Oh, I have no idea. No idea. I couldn't comment. I'm sure people were exploiting it. Whether that included the NSA, whether that's black hats, white hats, Chinese government, corporations, uh, the government of Botswana, who knows? Who cares? Okay. It's not important. Okay. Um, but really, why do we look, not look? It, it's so horrible. It's so awful to look at. Nobody wants to read that code base and work with it because of the way it is written. Really, it's about the way that it's put together if somebody's working on a project that incorporates it, they just say, oh, I don't have the time or the energy to invest in trying to clean this up because of the way it's written. I just want to hope that the upstream maintainers continue to deal with it. So it, it's really that awful. It's, it's Mike, Mike, Mike Rowe in the toilet. It's your parents talking about you know, where they made you or your parents having sex. It's pretty bad. <laughs> so we are all guilty of avoiding this. Every one of us who's looked at that code base, every one of us who's incorporated it into commercial products, we've all looked at that code base. We knew what it was, and we just said, oh, I'm glad we don't have to do it. So why was it so horrible? Well, we'll get into that right away. Okay. Um, but a bit, I mean, you've all heard about Heartbleed. Okay. <coughs> Heartbleed really was not the bug or the thing that made us say, oh, we can't do this anymore. We cannot have this in our tree. We cannot maintain it. We, we have to essentially fork the we are forking the product and just starting over, taking over maintenance of this ourselves, making a new version based on OpenSSL 1.01G. So why did we do that? The, the thing that really convinced us is their malloc replacement layer. Now I'm going to stop and talk a little bit about OpenBSD and why we do run software out of, from lots of places on OpenBSD machines that we don't necessarily audit, look at closely, or have 100% confidence in. Quite frankly, I really don't have, I've written enough software that I don't have 100% confidence in pretty much any piece of software. But my confidence lessens the, the less I know about it or, or depending on where it comes from. Now, when I run this kind of stuff personally on, Open, on an OpenBSD machine, what I do take to heart is that even when these kinds of pieces of software do have the typical kinds of bugs that they often have, you know, misuse of memory, overruns, underruns, leaks, all these kinds of things, there's a, a vast array, and I know Theo's talk, uh, talk you've, you've given the, you've given the mitigation talk at Coop. There's a vast array of built-in mitigation techniques that we've worked along and hard on having in OpenBSD to make sure that the address space layout is randomized, Everything that can be, be, be checked is. The address space is not writable or executable. All these fun things. So typically, when a program starts making mistakes with memory allocation, where it's using it, stuff like that, what will end up happening is that if these things are hit, the program will crash. So the goal of the runtime exploit mitigations in OpenBSD is we want correct programs to run correctly. And we want any kind of incorrect program not to run. We want it to crash. Okay? And crash quickly. Because what ends up happening with this is when we take your typical package, let's say Xwindows. Probably a bad example, but there's been a lot of them. All sorts of stuff. Mozilla, 
things that we port and run on OpenBSD, and all of a sudden people say, well, it's unreliable on OpenBSD. Why? Because it crashes. Why? It's full of bugs. And guess what? When it crashes, what happens is the people running it on OpenBSD and the porters on OpenBSD look at this and they say, hey, that's a problem. Stack trace blip. Feed that back to the upstream developers and they go, oh, well, that's bad. And they actually fix it. Okay? So what happens is by running these products on a hostile environment, one that is not uh, forgiving for mistakes, we find the mistakes, feed them upstream, and everybody benefits. That didn't happen with Heartbleed, and it wouldn't happen with most memory allocation errors in OpenSSL. And that's why the malloc replacement layer was the final straw for us. Essentially what they decided is because OpenSSL has been written for an awful lot of platforms. <sighs> platforms that uh, nobody has run since I didn't have gray hairs on my chest. Platforms that nobody has run since I didn't have hair on my chest. Okay? Uh, platforms that were being retired from everywhere when I had a mullet and parachute pants. Code is still an OpenSSL form. And this meant that they would run on all sorts of things that had all sorts of twisty little issues. One of the things they decided was malloc and free might be slow. Hmm. If malloc and free are slow, some of you know some C programming, do you think your platform's going to be very fast anyway? Nah, it's probably going to kind of suck. But OpenSSL will get around that for you by making sure that absolutely every platform that OpenSSL runs on essentially doesn't use malloc and free. It has its own memory allocation layer that it gets the memory the first time from malloc and never frees it. When you call free, it returns it to a last in first out list, okay, which just keeps it and reuses it the next time it wants to allocate memory of similar sized chunks. It might you might say it's similar to a badly implemented slab allocator, okay? But the other great part of it is it was last in first out. So what would happen is if you have the common code mistake of, oh, I allocate something. Oh, I free it, and I keep using it. Well, guess what? It hasn't gone anywhere. It's last in, first out. If you ask for it again because you freed it, but then you wanted it back, it's still there. Okay? What this meant, because it wasn't using any of the system allocation intrinsics, is that this would bypass absolutely every piece of exploit mitigation stuff we had. So therefore, all of these possibilities where Heartbleed might have been caught, the crashes would have been noticed, the overruns would have been caught, were not existent in OpenSSL. Okay? And what's more, it's plainly obvious that they, the maintainers of the product, really hadn't been worried about the state of the code base. They're interested in a few specific things that we'll get to. So that LIFO recycling malloc, I, I mean, I know I was sitting in Theo's basement, or not, I was sitting in Theo's living room as we were doing this, and it's like, no, no, it's gotta go, it's gotta go, it's gotta go. So, it included a debugging malloc as well. Now, most of the time, when, you want, when you're a programmer, and you actually want to debug something, okay, oh, I, I've, I've got a mess with my memory allocation, there's lots of tricks that we know as C programmers to link in a different version of malloc, okay? Or, my system malloc has features that I can turn on that let me debug my memory allocations. One or the other. But no, it's always in OpenSSL, even in your production code. Which means, if I'm an attacker and I can change one word of running memory in your process, it will start spitting out all the info about all the memory allocations and freeze to the log file. <laughs> and this includes cryptographic information. Maybe that might be a nice thing that you want, if you can get at the log. Um, it also includes the ability to replace the malloc and free at runtime, and it's always on. So again, modify one word, malloc and free, uh, can be whatever function you uh, you can turn it into the user replaceable. So, as I uh, one of my friends called it, it's a very very effective exploit mit mitigation technique countermeasure. Some of the rest of those are actually attack surfaces. It couldn't have been designed better to make it. It both makes Heartbleed hard to detect and it made it have dire consequences. Heartbleed was just you know a small allocation overrun, which if it wasn't that that last in first out property is there, the chances would have been less likely that you would have seen interesting stuff. You likely would have seen garbage on most attacks. But instead, 
because of the way that they did it, it almost ensured that there'd be something interesting and recently used there for you to look at. Fresh. Fresh, yeah. It actually would have hit a garden page. It would have, well, in our case, it would have hit a garden page and crashed. Okay, but not. But most other operating systems even would not have. Would not have. You're not making this stuff up. I'm not making this shit up. No. <laughs> so, um, one of the other nice things about this is uh, you probably, if, if any of you heard of Valgrind, Coverity, C programmers. Okay, Valgrind and Coverity are also great tools to help you find these these things if you're running a program through it. Well, again, Valgrind and Coverity wouldn't find this. Why? My memory wasn't free. It just allocated, it keeps using it, and then it exits, right? That's a perfectly acceptable model to Valgrind for a pro how a program works. So, none of those tools, if anybody ran it through it, would have said a peep about the OpenSSL code. Yeah? Did you have any discussions with the OpenSSL team before uh, you decided to fork it? <clears throat> yeah, no. <laughs> no. no. So, and here's why. So meanwhile at OpenSSL, it kind of appeared to be the perfect storm, okay? Uh, it's all hitting the press, their foundation director is, is, is you know, they're all mea culpa, we're really sorry but we have no money. Well they don't actually have no money. When you actually look at it, uh, their, their foundation, quote, I used to use it loosely, quote foundation director, you know, said, oh we're really bad, it's really bad, but we're actually uh, supporting ourselves by using OpenSSL as a custom code base to uh, do FIPS consultancy because you know there's all sorts of US government agencies on the beltway and if you live in Maryland you can make a great living as a FIPS consultant and so essentially uh, the OpenSSL quote foundation unquote sells service contracts for OpenSSL to get yourself certified as FIPS okay uh, and as you, and what we would notice is the only thing that was being committed to that source tree other than banal fixes were uh, patches for their FIPS mode which is intrusive throughout the tree. So we kind of look at this and we know where OpenSSL's uh, focus is, if you will. It's certainly not ours. Uh, fixes that were sent to them are not merged by the upstream. Okay? Bugs that rot for years in their bug tracker are ignored. And this is the great part. When we found the problems with the memory allocator, and that you could turn off their memory allocator, uh, Ted Unex, who you might have seen, some of you might have seen his blog entries, and, and Ted was actually when I gave this talk in Ottawa, Ted was there, and so I would pick on Ted, and Theo did not dress appropriately. Theo was supposed to be my Ted this time, which means he had to be in shorts and flip-flops. <laughs> but but uh, he, it's fine. Um, Ted uh, actually found this problem and fixed it in our tree, reported it upstream, and immediately got a CVE number because it's actually, it, it is an exploitable issue. This issue was actually found, and then he actually found a better fix than the fix he committed for us, and changed it. Why? A Polish fellow named Pavel, I forget his last name, found it four years ago and submitted it to OpenSSL. It was sitting in their bug tracker since 2010, and they'd ignored it. And so we took the fix from them, committed it, said thank you to the guy who had it there. Meanwhile, they, I don't know, what? Well, what? There's a CVE marked 2000. It was interesting. The CVE was marked 2010. Whatever. The, the bug tracking people. Um, the long and the short of it is really the horrible code base discourages outside involvement. There's a few people at OpenSSL who work with the code base. I don't know whether it's been left awfully awful deliberately, but basically nobody wants to get involved because it's too hard to work in, work in this environment. Okay. Everybody looks at it, goes back to doing their own stuff, hopes like heck. There are many more. So, the only solution for us was to grab a big fork. Okay? Uh, everything in there is rotting away, the bugs in the allocator, they are obviously not, it's obviously not a priority to fix the robustness of this code base for OpenSSL. They are more interested in bringing in new features, sitting on standards bodies, and dealing with their FIPS stuff. They're not interested in maintaining the code. That's completely obvious to us. Okay? So, we said enough. They're just adding to it. We'd never be able to clean this to the standards that we would expect to be able to work with it and work with them. We know the changes would be too intrusive. They'd never accept them. They won't accept a three-line fix that fixes a security issue that's sitting in their bug tracker for four years. Until we fix it. So, what's Libra? So basically we said enough. We're taking this thing over and we're calling it something else. 
Okay. So the initial goals is we want to preserve as much as possible API and ABI compatibility with OpenSSL. By and large, we want to be a drop-in replacement. There are other SSL, TLS type libraries out there, but generally speaking, they do not have the same API. That might for them be a good thing, but what it does mean is most of the software base out there is written to use, for better or for worse, the OpenSSL API. The way to get at these routines is through the OpenSSL type library. We want to bring more people into working at the code base, bring more eyes into looking at the code base, primarily by making it less horrible. <laughs> You're laughing like it's funny. It's true. It's, it's amazing with the amount of work we've done on it already, and you know, yes, part of it has been the press attention, but we've actually picked up a number of people who have showed up on our lists, and you always get the cranks. You always get the people who just do stupid fixes, but you can get people on the list who are submitting real genuine things back to us, stuff we're not having to do. Better yet, every one of the four or five of us who are primarily involved in shredding this, I know I've done it, Ted's done it, Miode's done it, you've been hiking too much to have done it. But I did a mistake yesterday. You did make a mistake yesterday. We've all looked at it. Well, the rest of us have looked at it and said, yeah, that's okay, committed something, and then missed a piece. And somebody on the list, before we notice, says, hey, that isn't quite right. We go, oh yeah, thanks. It's one, and, which is wonderful. It's wonderful to have the outside world looking at what you're committing and checking it. Okay? More eyes means a more people care, and you're less likely to make a mistake. I'm human. I can fuck it up with the numbers. They make different stupid Okay? They make different stupid mistakes, but enough eyes looking at the code, watching for these problems, means you're more likely to catch them and not have something horrible slip through the cracks. Whereas I guarantee you, when you're doing massive multi-line commits to support something in an RFC that nobody will ever use, on New Year's Eve, I guarantee you, nobody's looking at what you committed. Mm -hmm. Nobody cares, because nobody's going to use that feature, and nobody's looking at it for security issues. Which is how Hartley got in. Okay? We want to fix bugs, of course, and we've probably fixed more than I can count so far. Uh, most importantly, we want to get into modern coding practices. Yes, there is modern styles of C code. They are vastly different from the C code that was written when we had, you know, mullets and parachute pants. Okay? You don't write C like that anymore. And we want to do portability, right? So, let's step back a bit and talk a little bit about how some another project that OpenBSD is developed in OpenBSD. Um, you probably use this unless you live under a rock um, or are able to work exclusively on Windows, uh, and that would be OpenSSH. Okay, uh, it's ported to pretty much everything on the planet that matters. It has OpenSSH working on it. Okay, you know Windows. Um, <laughs> It assumes, a, yeah, basically, how do we do that? We assume the same target OS, OpenBSD. We code to the coding standards in OpenBSD using the intrinsics and primitives provided by OpenBSD. That's how we do it. We don't worry about anything else and any other platform when actually writing code for OpenSSH. At okay? that point, we build and maintain that using modern C techniques we change it when we discover things we want to do differently. We've even discovered things to do differently as a result of this. And at that point, a portability team provides portability shims to correctly do things that other OSs don't provide, but only for those OSs that need it. So if we have a way that we, for instance, take a piece of memory and zero it explicitly so that the compiler doesn't optimize that out and not zero the memory, which is important in cryptographic things, we have a way to do that. We make sure that then, in the library that is included for portability, oh, I need a way to do that on Linux, then the Linux way to do that is in there. It does, we don't change the, the base code to understand how to do that. Similarly, forgetting random values, random numbers, good stuff like that. If, for instance, Linux doesn't have sterlcat and sterlcopy, those functions are provided with the portability shims. We don't not use those in our own stuff, or we don't put if defs throughout the mainline code. So, 
no if def maze, no compromise on what the intrinsic functions actually do. We reuse all the standard intrinsics and we don't re-implement libc. Just because we decide not every function has, you know, printf, oh, we won't use printf anywhere, we'll write our own version and provide it. No, okay? We still use the standard functions with the standard APIs so other programmers could come in and look at this and understand what's going on. Okay? How open SSL does support that? Open SSL assumes the OS provides nothing because you can't break support for Visual C 1.52 or Mac OS not X, Mac OS Classic. Everybody needs to run OpenSSL on that machine that you're playing Crystal Quest on, your Mac SE30, right? Zing, 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 okay? That you didn't convert to a fishbowl yet, okay? Um, a spaghetti mess of if, def, if, and def, or... Yeah. Okay, how many of you are C programmers? Remember, okay. Here's how you do stuff in OpenSSL. You have a command line switch, which is a whole bunch of OpenSSL no foo, or OpenSSL foo bar, or OpenSSL spork, or OpenSSL spam, all of which turn things on or off. You think, you hope. Okay? Then what you do, and so all of these turn on support for particular operating systems, okay? Or particular features, or particular things. And generally what you'll do inside OpenSSL code is you do if def OpenSSL X. Else if OpenSSL Y. Else if OpenSSL Z. Else if <laughs> they're testing you. OpenSSL Q. If, if indef OpenSSL Y. <laughs> so somewhere in this nested if def, 17 deep maze of if and def horror, maybe it's at the bottom, maybe it's in the middle, is a case that falls out that says, Oh, it's OpenSSL Unix, which means it's just frickin' POSIX, which is what 99% of the stuff that it's compiled on is. Okay? But everything is ensconced in all this crap. Okay? So we had to go through and figure out all this spaghetti maze of if, def, horror. And I say it's written in OpenSSL C, which is essentially its own dialect to program to the worst pro common denominator. Remember when I said, oh, maybe some operating systems don't have ASPrintf, so we won't use asprintf, or we won't even use printf. We'll make our own function that just concatenates strings together. And we'll use that. Okay? So, don't, no, 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 you don't need to know about standards. We've got our own primitives library that you use. Okay? Um, we implement our own layers of abstraction for us, all platforms to use it, not just those that have, that have it. And so it's a source of a lot of pain. It assumes the entire world is stuck in 1989. And it's written. So, we sent a lot of things to Valhalla. Epsidic support went away. <laughs> DOS. <laughs> Don't laugh! You're all, how many of you are, anybody here running a machine that's not OpenBSD? Yeah. Anybody here running a machine that talks to the internet? Yeah. Anybody running a machine that speaks SSL on any protocol? You're running this fucking shit. <laughs> yeah, so. You are! You're running this stuff, okay? Um, EPSIC support, yay! DOS support, gotta be a, oh yeah! DOS with, and the, and now the best part about the DOS support was there's was, there was flags for three or four, because remember with DOS you didn't have networking. You had to add stuff to DOS to make DOS do TCP IP. And there were three or four different products you could add into DOS that would do TCP IP, right? So of course there's different compilers that would do that. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that. Yeah, so there was there was a bunch of that. That died long with your mullet. It, I think it died long before my mullet. I, I think it died before I had a lot of hair. Anyway, uh, Mac OS Classic support for pre OS 10, Windows 16, and many variants of Windows support. Um, a whole lot of obtuse things you've ever heard of. Uh, the favorite one was found. Uh, it takes a lot to make one of the fellows working on this, Miod Valet. Miod is a wonderful guy, and he's legendary in OpenBSD as the guy who likes really old, crappy stuff. The rest of us kind of laugh at him sometimes, but we respect him very much for his skills. He's a very talented guy. Uh, he pretty much single-handedly keeps the OpenBSD Vax port alive, yes. and the because they love it. Um, <laughs> Miot has showed up at a hackathon and with his laptop, which is a Spark, not 
Spark 64, Spark Tadpole at the time. So Miode likes old, slow computers. But this was too much even for Miode because there was handwritten code. Handwritten and not assembler. Y'all know what assembler is, right? And there's assembler in this code base. That's fine. We could deal with assembler. This is handwritten octal opcodes to support a machine called a tandem. They call it actual. It's actual binary code, just blurp, 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 blurp in there. No, no, it's, that was there, and Miode ripped this out. Even Miode, this was too much for Miode. It did not appeal properly to Miode's sense of the, the nostalgic. So, the list of what we've actually pulled out of that is a lot longer than what I have there. But the point is, is all this stuff really gets in the way. It gets in the way of us being able to look at this code and understand it. It definitely gets in the way of anybody being able to maintain it. If you want to change something, but then you have to, to make your change work, go back and retroactively apply it to 18 levels of IFDEF for support for operating systems that nobody is ever going to test, would you do that? You think any of them even still work? <laughs> no. Are you kidding? Where do you get the test platforms from? We don't care. Um, so the point is, get rid of it. Get rid of the IFDEF horror. We no longer need to maintain it and work around it. Um, the if def horror hello VMS, I don't know if you're reading the bits at the bottom. If Norse legends are true, Epsidic will meet me in Valhalla and we will be friends as long as I die with my fingers on a keyboard. Um, <laughs> and uh, if any of you remember good old Lovecraft and Cthulhu, uh, Ted, Ted, Unig, Ted Unix was just horrified about some of the VMS. And we would kill VMS and we'd think we had it all and it would still be in there. And then there'd be another pass of killing more VMS stuff and another pass of killing more VMS stuff. It was just, just dreadful to get out of there. Uh, and the quote is basically uh, in his house in, uh, in his house in o Pound Define Open VML, Open SSL VMS, Cthulhu sits dreaming. Uh, <laughs> the Open SSL now, memory allocator, we nuked it from orbit. Uh, gone, ripped it out, ripped out the support for it, ripped out the ability to add new memory allocators, ripped out the ability to change it, made it all use intrinsics. Uh, suddenly security tools that notice memory allocation issues could actually work on this code base. Somebody turned off the thing on the OpenSSL code base and ran it through, was it Coverity? Coverity, over 150. Over 150 flaws that I never saw before. <laughs> <laughs> they turned it off. Um, so more on the allocator functions, we ripped out the debug Matlock. The wrappers remain. Now remember, this is exposed API. So. Crypto, you know, we have OpenSSL malloc, crypto malloc, well, it's OpenSSL malloc, but pound defined to crypto malloc. Then there's crypto malloc set debug, <laughs> crypto malloc options foo, crypto malloc options bar, crypto re uh, there's a whole raft of them. Oh, and then because if you have one memory system, it's good to have a few more, a few of the others have other stuff that ends up defining to that. All of this is exposed API, meaning it's in the OpenSSL header files, and something out there, we don't know what, might be using it. We don't know. Now, we haven't deleted them. The wrappers remain. They are exposed API, but in our in LibreSSL, they just call the intrinsics. They don't call the weird allocator. You can't replace them. Uh, turning on debug mode does nothing. Trying to replace them at runtime is not allowed. Okay? Now, just as we... Does that cause a crash? What? Does that cause a crash? No. Well, I don't know. If your program can't handle the fact that it failed, it might cause a crash, but that's your program. It would be awfully nice if it caused yeah. a crash. Yeah. 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 We could make it cause a crash, but we're not going to do that. The, the point is, not here to effectively break the upstream ecosystem. We want the upstream ecosystem to keep working. Okay. The library itself, however, so even though we provide OpenSSL malloc, crypto malloc, all those good stuff, we don't use them anywhere. Okay. Recently, some of them snuck back in, and then we made, did some more aggressive things to make sure we will never use them again. In fact, when we compile Libra SSL, they're no longer in the headers. They are for everybody else. Okay? We only use intrinsics in the library. We use malloc, free, calloc, realloc, and it's just a new function in OpenBSD called realloc array. Okay? The necessary conversions that we've gone through the library and done, and we're still doing, but a whole lot of them have been done, there's a whole lot of places where, oh, malloc memory, mem set it to zero, please. Calloc has done this 
Back to mullet and parachute pants jokes. Calloc has done this for a long time. Replace that idiom with calloc. Malloc x times y. You get, oh, I want to allocate, I will have foo things, and they're all of size bar. Malloc, foo times bar. Okay? There's a problem with that. Okay? Foo times bar, how big can that get? What if foo and bar are big? Could they get bigger than the size of an integer? What if they were integers and they got bigger than the size of an integer? What? They could go negative. Bad things can happen. So the short and long and short of it is, you want to be able to do this multiplication safely. You want to do that multiplication safely while testing to see if it overran. Okay? And so you can either put code everywhere to test that, so that you know that it's safe, or you actually make a function that tests it for you when it does the multiplication. Now on OpenBSD, calloc tests. Okay? So when you do calloc, foo, comma, bar, okay, it actually tests foo bar to see if it would overflow, and if it would, it returns an error instead of puking. Instead of returning crazy allocations. Okay? Now the problem is we didn't have anything that was like calloc that would do that for the malloc case. Now why would you want that? Well, you just want to allocate the memory, but you don't want to take the cost of constantly zeroing the memory, because calloc zeroes memory. So we essentially made a new function called realloc array, takes the same kind of arguments that calloc does, okay, but doesn't zero the memory, but does do the overflow check. Now any of you wondering why we're so paranoid about this? Other than Theo, who knows why we are so paranoid about this? Wasn't that one of the, um, the installed uh, bugs in OpenBSD? You are correct. Give the man a gold star. So there is, on the OpenBSD website, it says only two remote holes in a heck of a long time. That was one of them, okay? In SSH, okay, that was uh, our first remote hole in OpenBSD, was due to malloc x times y in a drawer. Okay. Uh, the other one is this code base has fraught with, you know, you imagine you allocate free memory a lot. Everywhere this thing allocates in free memory. If, you know, if this not equal to null, realloc. If this not equal to null, free. No. Every operating system that has been around for ages, these things handle null and ignore them and do the right thing. <coughs> Stop doing this. Get rid of all of that testing that just makes the code gross. Okay, hard to read. So, our next topic. Open SSO. So, really, you can laugh at the cartoon for a minute. But really, what is SSL? Okay, seriously, you guys use this. What is SSL and TLS? Somebody give me what is it? Huh? Secure socket layer. Secure sockets layer. So, what does it do? Secures your sockets. So what, what's it about? What kind of stuff is in this code? Encryption. Encryption. Yes. Is that most of what it does? No. It's probably 15 to 20 percent of that code base is actually encryption functions. Okay. The rest of it is protocol conversion. It's picking up a bytes off of this kind of socket and putting them onto this kind of socket. Picking them up calling a function, copying bytes, and pasting them around. So that's what, one thing it does. The other thing it does, which is not part of encryption, is getting entropy. You need entropy so you can generate keys. Because that's just both when you want to make a new key for yourself, that doesn't happen very often. Okay? What happens every time you make a TLS connection is ephemeral keys are generated for that session. They better be generated not predictably. Okay? If I know that you've booted your Linux machine, and I know that your server is probably PID 1046, because it always is, because they're in predictable sequence, and you generate your ephemeral key with random get PID, I have a pretty good idea of what your key is. Or maybe I can only try 32,000 alternatives and I will get what your key is no matter what. Get it? So, that, I, I'm grossly oversimplifying it, but the point is, you need a good source of not predictable entropy Okay, to generate these kind of session keys or anything used for, for encryption. The encryption algorithms are fine, but if you use them with predictable keys, who cares? Okay? And there's been an awful lot of attacks like this over the years. So, OpenSSL contains 
reams and reams and reams and reams of code to try to get entropy. And remember, it assumes the operating system provides it with nothing. So everybody gets to use their entropy layer. And their entropy layer is full of all sorts of tests that say, oh, I don't think, if I, for some reason, don't think I have enough entropy, do something insane. <laughs> okay? Oh, you think I'm exaggerating. <laughs> but anyway, the third reality short of it is you look at all this, it's gross. So it's the principle of you can't do something right because, well, oh my god, DOS doesn't provide us with the support to do it right, so we should just do it badly everywhere. No, you should not support DOS. Okay, or all sorts of things. So, maybe it's like cake. Bad cake's better than no cake. Um, OpenSSL's attempts to do this have resulted in all sorts of horror. There's EGD, the entropy gathering demon. So, yeah, let's make an external demon that anybody can talk to to read the entropy off of so that we know what the next sources of it are going to be. That was just a bad idea in the first place. Support for it was still everywhere. Because support for it was everywhere, people would look at this and say, this is the right style of how to write secure code. So other projects were picking up this crap and using it. We deleted it. Delete, 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 delete. So we removed support for EGD. It's a horribly bad idea. However, as I said, there's all these tests all throughout the stuff where it, the library calls this function to see if it has entropy. If for whatever reason it decides it doesn't have entropy, because maybe an attacker twisted a little button that said it doesn't have entropy, it's just a flag. Okay. It's one word to modify. Um, it goes, oh, I've got to do something. So in the RSA key generation stuff, it says, I don't have enough random entropy. Well, I'll feed the intermediate bits of your RSA key to the random number generator to make it have enough entropy. That must be good. My favorite part is that if the EGD daemon is running, yeah. it will actually pass your RSA key yeah. out of the security. It passes your RSA key out to the EGD daemon, where somebody else can read it. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome! It's okay. Don't, don't ask because it's yeah. not. Of course we can get, get PID, get time of day, but now you see this little snippet of C code. Yeah. Char star seed equals, quote, string to give the random number generator, generator randomness. You think I'm kidding. <laughs> you think I found it once? <laughs> no. It's all over the place in there. Okay? We found idioms like this all over the place. We deleted all of them. <laughs> no, I'm the <laughs> Now, the nice part, people wouldn't see them because there's a thing. Remember, it's a little flag. And most of the time, you're okay. So this is only that if, it, if something bad happens, we resort to this crap. But what if I want to make something bad happen? Okay? It's a whole new mode of, if I can make something bad happen, really interesting things start happening here. We don't like that. So they become an attack target and attack surface. And, and we don't want this. We've ripped out all support for this. It's gone. Entropy is the responsibility of the operating system, okay? If your operating system can't provide you with a good source of random data, it will not be the Marissa Sills job to fake it. I actually got applause in Ottawa when I gave that, that slide. Um, we know we can't do, and, and we know, we know in a user land library, without touching the OS kernel, we can't do this right. We will fail. We will do a half-assed job. Therefore, if we can only do a half-assed job, we will not do it at all. It is a requirement, if you're going to use OpenSSL on your system, that you have a reasonable source of entropy on the operating system. If you don't, fix your operating system, not the SSL library. Okay? Um, <laughs> paging Dr. Singh, paging Dr. Joel Singh, the ER, coach our truce. Uh, the patient requires an emergency KNFectomy. <laughs> this has become a verb that we use. Now, I, I gave this talk in front of a bunch of FreeBSD developers, and they actually know what KNF is. Some of you may not. KNF is kernel normal form. What this is is man style on an OpenBSD box, and you will see what KNF is essentially. Um, it's a C coding standard that says where, where the braces should go, how far you should indent, how far you should indent secondary statements. It's very fascist. Some, some bits of it are very wonderful. All of it. Parts of it chafe on all of us, I'm sure, but we stick to it. The point is, it is a consistent, readable, compact style. It's not spaghetti. Okay? And so, we've been going through this stuff, 
and just refactoring all the code to be in a consistent, readable style with consistent, readable indentation. Okay? And that's been a huge... When we say we need an emergency KNF ectomy, it has been... Joel has been doing the KNF work by and large in bulk on the code base, and we get into a directory and it's like, oh god, I've got to fix this. Oh, and it's, it's awful. Ah, Joel, please come in here, fix this so I can start working on it, because otherwise you start working on it and it's, you, you can't deal with it. So, we're KNFing the whole thing, it makes it more readable, and sometimes it makes the other horrors visible. Okay? More readable, consistent style, even if it's not your favorite style, at least it's consistent, means more developer involvement. Okay? Hopefully more people will be looking at this with us. Uh, the OpenSSL bug tracking RT has been and continues to be a fantastic resource. And it's a great resource because it's a great resource not just for bugs. It's a great resource for community involvement. You want to know, nothing makes somebody happier than they've done a whole frankly, crap ton of work, diagnosing an obscure bug in OpenSSL. They have provided a fix with code. They said, this does this. Here's the reason. Here's the fix. Please apply it. You know, maybe give me credit, but just please apply it. And nothing's happening. And all of a sudden, we go in there, we start applying their fixes, we mail them and say thank you, and we mail the open, <laughs> and their name shows up in a CVE where it's like, oh yeah, this has been here for 10 years, found by this guy. Okay? Nothing makes people happier than that. And they now get involved with us. So, the bugs seem to go there to die. We've gone through the R RT, a whole bunch of people have been peeling through it with us, and we fixed a lot of bugs straight out of their request tracker. Um, OpenSSL still hasn't fixed lots of them. There was a great one where it'll follow a null pointer if you uh, send it a crafted uh, uh, options request, and it's still there, because uh, they decided they didn't like the way, I, I think I fixed this one. Yeah, I did, because I did it on my couch talking to Ted, committed the fix, and I think Ted, you know, Ted and I agreed the fix was minimal and worked, they thought it was a hack because it was too minimal, and they, they've been bike shedding it ever since, arguing over the quality of the fix, and they decided, oh, we, we won't fix it in this release, it'll be fixed in some future release, it's still there. So that's fine. Um, but the interesting part is, like I said, these users are starting to ask us first. There's a great guy out of Stanford who is now feeding us stuff. Stanford has a research tool that is looking for problems. It's a static code analyzer that their own students are writing and working on, and now, once they, you know, they, they run it over OpenSSL and submitted some bugs, and OpenSSL ignored them, and now we started paying attention to them, now they're sending stuff to us. And we like it, because it finds bugs. Okay? It's great. Okay? So the OpenSSL RT has both gotten us bugs to fix and community involvement. And, and really, when it comes down to it, I know you guys think that the bug fixing is great. The community involvement is wonderful for us. It gets more people helping us do this, because it's a big, big, ugly, messy, up to your elbows and triceratops poop <laughs> job. <laughs> Okay. How big was the code base? Oh, you... uh, I'll get there. One slide. I think you're about one more slide, one or two slides away from that. Okay. So the other problem: all the APIs are belong to include OpenSSL. Now, I'm not an, an object-oriented programming fan. It's okay, but most of my exposure to it has been to people who. Take, you know, it's like that Monty Python thing with follow the gourd, you know. Yeah, yeah. I found the Messiah and I will follow him. So most of the time you see a zealot espousing tools. You know, you know it's just a tool, it's just a hammer. It's good for things that a hammer is good for, it's not good for things a hammer is not good for. So I'm not one to say you should never expose any API. Oh, private, everything should be private. Yeah, no, 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 not necessarily one of that. But the other extreme, which is absolutely every useless, crappy little internal function that is never even written, used, or called, is sitting there in an exposed public header file, used by thousands of pro software projects all over the internet. We look at this and say, well, this is obviously unmitigated crap. Can we delete it? We don't know. Okay? okay. <coughs> well, we mitigate this to some extent, but it's hard. Okay, so lots of the API probably shouldn't be used outside of the library, but we just don't know for sure. We're slowly finding out 
And this is uh, a big part of what uh, some of our, our Intrepid Ports guys are doing, which is they run constant builds of almost 9,000 pieces of software on nine architectures. And this means when we change something like this, they find out about it and they yell at us. Okay? And maybe, sometimes they yell at us and we know, or we, we know ahead of time. We've had them go look. They say, oh yeah, this doesn't occur in very many places, and it's stupid, and we'll fix it and send it upstream, which is great. So we make the change, there's an obvious thing that should have been done instead of this, and they push those fixes to the upstream maintainers, or until they take them, they keep the patches in our tree. More often, they catch us doing something stupid. Well, maybe not stupid. It's actually smart, we just can't do it yet. Okay? Not without causing great damage to our compatibility with the rest of the world. So, we'd like to put the exposed API on a diet to allow us to remove some of the unused stuff, especially some of the stuff that's dangerous. But for the moment, we're having to be pretty cautious to make sure we remain compatible with the rest of the ecosystem out there. We don't want to break every piece of software out there written to use OpenSSL. We want them to be able to use this. If this isn't used, nobody gets the benefit. Okay. So. As I said, we've moved the library to use Intrinsics. We can't remove things like BioSprintF and CryptoMalloc, their exposed API, but we moved the library to use all the regular Intrinsic functions. Instead of these, we have regular Intrinsic functions in the library. That means even though the guck is still there and the wrappers are still there, when you're looking at most of the OpenSSL code now, you can read it. You can understand what's there. Once people understand what's there, because it's using actual real POSIX APIs that a lot of people understand how to use, that means we can get more people involved in looking at this. Okay? Rather than weird APIs that, not, that are not normal. Um, one of them, it's actually the one at the top there, BioS and Printf has been one of the ones I've been on a pogrom against. Uh, everybody here knows how SN Printf works? You print into a string limited by a length. Okay? And it's, it's a useful function in a security context. However, the return value is very important. If S and printf would have tried to, would have overrun the string, okay, in other words, it will always guarantee the string is null terminated, but if it was going to write more than would fit the string, it returns you to you a larger value than what you asked. So if you asked it to print to limit to 10 and it needed 15, it would return you 15. Okay? It would return minus 1 if it failed. Early versions of SN printf on <coughs> Windows returned minus one for overrun as well. The result being you can't check whether you got over it, difference between overrun and failure, and you can't test and extend it if you need to. The problem is, because it ret returns minus one all the time, they decided that the best way to do this in OpenSSL was to always have it return minus one like the Windows one. Okay. Well, it's okay if you know that it's happening. But I went through the tree. There's about 500 odd uses of BIOS and printf. Okay, and, and so we'll, this takes us to the next slide. It's not normal. There's about 500 uses of BIOS and printf. Of those, about 20 check the return value. Now you're going to laugh. They're not checking the return value. That's not necessarily a bad thing. If you know that truncation is okay, okay, don't check the return value. A little void, void in front of it. I'm ignoring it because I don't care if this string is chopped off. It's some stupid error message. Something like that. Who cares? Okay. But there's places where the truncation does matter and you need to do something. Now, I didn't look yet to see, I'm not talking about yet to see if all those 480 uses of it are okay, but there were 20 that looked at the return value. So obviously they had to care. Of the 20 that looked at the return value, I believe something like 12 okay, actually assumed that it returned the length that it needed. The POSIX API. Why? Because people who look at this assume it's SN printf and they code to the POSIX API. It's going to return minus one. So it's disastrously wrong. Okay? This is just the height of stupidity. Making a function that looks like a regular standard API and it's not in a way that programmers will screw it up royally. I did finally mark it deprecated. I want to remove it. Because <laughs> it's so bad. And we don't use it internally anymore at all. Uh, if you use it externally now and use our header file, it will warn. Uh, BioSturDoop isn't normal either. It, ignore, it silently ignores null. Regular sturdoop does not. It will crash. 
Say yes or no, but it's different. Um, error add data. Remember how I said we don't have printf, so we'll make our own function. How did I get in here? <laughs> Ted was grepping the code and says, look at this. And I go, here's my name in the code base. <laughs> Nothing I've touched. It's in the open SSL code base. But I kind of went, how the hell did that get in there? And then I remember, I believe it was probably 15 years ago. Where was Ben Laurie where we were? Ted did, well, Ted was in the project too. I don't remember. It might have been MIT. And I think it was MIT. Ben Laurie was at MIT, and we were hacking away on stuff, finding all kinds of bugs, and I told Ben about a way that I could make OpenSSL vomit. Okay? <laughs> and fine. And it had to do with this wonderful fun. I, I now know what it is, because I now looked. Okay? Error add error data was a var args function. Var args in C works where you just keep going on the stack, getting arguments. You have no idea where to stop. Better hope you know where to stop. So they make a var args function by just adding a number. So if you call error add data four, you better provide four pointers. And it just takes strings and concatenates them together and spits them to the error output. That's all it does. But because it just takes strings, and what they're doing is making error messages, what do they want to do in an error message? They want to do formatted output. They want to do percent %d and all this. So the net result is, most of the time before you called error add data, it would introduce horrible hacks. You'd see things like this. You know the function's going to be good when it starts with a line like that. That's real open SSL code. Okay? And what they're doing is they're, they would then take SN printf, print in a bunch of stuff, error equals foo, SN printf a bunch of stuff, build together six temporary little strings and it, with crazy magic number end checking and call error add data to add all the strings to the error buffers. Jesus Christ, just do AS printf and boom. So I replaced it with one function, which is error as printf error data. We've ripped all the uses of this out of the tree. And by the way, what I told Ben Laurie was that the thing follows null and crashes, error add error data. And I found out where it was because when I replaced them all, remember I said it was a var args function that says take, if you put four, you better provide four data. There were two instances in OpenSSL where it said four and only provided two pointers, so it's reading two values <laughs> off the stack. It usually would get zero and it would puke. The fix with my name on it was ignore null pointers in error add data. <laughs> no, that's not where I want my name. Please, please, I don't want my name associated. So I had to delete this code on principle. I did. Uh, now we get into the lulls. Read that top one. It's in there. Why is it in there? Okay, now, you probably guess that I'm not usually speechless, and I'll tell you that I was made, I was rendered speechless in Ottawa, but I'll tell you why it's in there first. Okay? It's in there because probably, I, I'm guessing it's something like a master's thesis sponsored by a company. Somebody hacked the living snot out of QMU to run i386 in big Indian mode and then produced a version of GCC that would compile i386 in big Indian mode, and obviously made hacks to OpenSSL to support this and got it into their code base. Better yet, not only was that in there, better yet, someone decided when they were making some changes to it that since somebody did it for 32-bit i386, somebody might do it for 64-bit, so the code base should be ready in case somebody does anything this batshit crazy again <laughs> and wants to compile OpenSSL and run it in an emulator. And run it in an emulator. <laughs> and by the way, as I'm telling this story now, I know you, if you watch my YouTube video of the of a, of a quicker version of this talk for developers, you'll hear something in the back. And the ends with horror, laughter, me holding my face, and I say basically, remember the slide about your parents making, I said, Jesus Warner, now I'm thinking about my parents making me. Because Warner Lodge described, she says, no, 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 at Cisco, they have a version of the AMD64 i386 compiler because the router software is big Indian that will go through and does halfway hacks 
to do fetches and stores in Big Indian mode so that they can, on an i386 machine, use this hacked up version of the compiler to take the uh, iOS source code, grind it through it, and spit out a, running a workable running router image. <laughs> <laughs> and and we're, we're telling me this in my and I talk, and I'm just going like, no. <laughs> I don't think they use this. Okay. Anyway, that's big MD and AMD 64 support. We deleted it. <laughs> remember the defines? Okay, remember how I said the defines are interesting? There's two defines. You can turn on the define for no old as and one to turn off the old as and one code. You can also turn on the define no as and one old, and they don't do the same thing. <laughs> and functions that were called in one were defined in an if block for the other. <laughs> I think this is tested well. We deleted that. Um, fun with Socklen T. Who here knows what Socklen T is? What? It's the length of a socket, the type that you store the length of a socket in. The type you store a length of a socket in. That when you call things like accept, you get back. Oh, except gives me a socket and the structure is this size. Okay. On most systems, pound define sock length t int is enough. On others, pound define sock length t size t is enough. Okay? It's that type. Who cares? Okay? Um, in OpenSSL, there's this lovely comment above this nightmarish pile of code, <laughs> which is then used anytime they call accept. Now, let's see if I get this right. You're going to fail. I'm going to fail, and Theo will correct me, but I'm going to get close. You will fail too, but it's impossible to, but it's impossible to describe. Ted could describe it, and, and it was just horrific. So, what they do, because you couldn't tell whether it was int or size t. I'm wondering how the rest of the world deals with this. But here's how OpenSSL deals with this. They define a union of int and size t. Now, whenever they call accept, what they pass in as accept for the initial length is 16 gigabytes. Because accept will never return to you this much. Now why do they pass in 16 gigabytes? Because they take this union and they fill it with FFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFF
However, the code itself only uses one key and one IP. And the test vector was generated with that code, so it always passes. So. Okay. So we did now send me into that. Yeah, it, it's nothing. It's just junk. It's never worked. It's never worked anywhere. And uh, they say it's, it's not junk because the test vector is correct. So it at least works with one key and one ID. We deleted it. Um, more laws. The magical assembler rock coding function. Okay? Anytime you call particular assembler bits on I386 or Win64, because in Windows it can't tell if you're in real mode or... No. What's... On Windows... Anyway. The long and the short of it is this is a lovely function so that they have... They can't tell what Windows is going to do. So they provide a function that will jump to an arbitrary address, call it as a function, and fix up your stack afterwards. Just let the... the override. Okay, who here knows what rock is? It's return-oriented programming. Okay, what ROP is, is if, if you're on something like, if you're trying to exploit something on, let's say, OpenBSD, and you can't write code into anywhere that's executable, because our, code sp our, our page space is that way, what you want to do is you want to make a program do certain things. But there's lots of functions and addresses out there that are executable. So what you do is you work search in the address space for, oh, look, if I go here, let's say it'll add 1, register 1, and return. Okay? If I go here, it'll add 10 and return. You find all these chains of addresses that will do little things in return. And so what you do is when you can actually get a control of call, uh, get control of a pointer or a call, you just chain these addresses together, call these function trails, if you wish, function tails, if you want, to do what you want. Okay? It's called return-oriented program. I've oversimplified a bit. But this is a rock coder's dream. If he knows where that function is, in the library, <laughs> and if you're running OpenSSL, you can find it, because it's there, okay? This is a great way to be able to help you put together a, a ROP exploit, because you don't just have to find, you can actually just go out there and try it, see where you get it, okay? Um, backwards compatibility for a mistake that lasted a month. Uh, there was a thing in there, a big hack, to say, this should go away soon. So it was OpenSSL 0.95 made a boo-boo in one of the arguments, okay? So what they did, they, they, they gave it the wrong name. So what they did is they added an if def, they added a, oh, let's support the, the misspelled argument or the other argument. This should go away soon. The mistake was brought in in OpenSSL 0.95. It was a month until OpenSSL 0.96 was released. So this actual bug was there for a month. Uh, and that, by the way, OpenSSL 0.95 was released 14 years ago. And OpenSSL 0.96 was released a month after that. And the hack to support the mistake was still there. So it's Y2K problem. Uh, not Y2K problem. It's why would you keep this around? <laughs> Nobody's going to be using this by now. Keep it around for a bit. Y2K. Okay. And, and the, the, I guess the final laugh that I'll... Uh, well, I, I won't talk about the last bit, but there's another one we even found today. And the one we found today, that Miode sent me just to annoy me, because he knew I would yell about it, okay, was if pointer and pointer equals value, pointer and pointer equals value, pointer. What the fuck is this? It's not testing anything. It's been added, it's junk. It was added with a commit done, when was Heartbleed introduced? Remember? New Year's Eve? A commit on New Year's Eve? Well, this piece of particular piece of poo, was added with a commit on Christmas Day, 2000. <laughs> a nonsensical test. It's, it's junk. We look at it, that doesn't make any sense. Well then, that was back before they had DTLS support. So how did you do DTLS support? Well, DTLS is TLS over UDP. It's mostly TLS with a few things, but it needs a separate piece of it. Now, since you don't understand the code base, because nobody can fucking understand the code base, Instead of writing DTLS from scratch, what you do is you take TLS, copy, paste, rename, and twiddle with it until it's DTLS. Okay? So they copied and pasted this nonsense test. They obviously did go through the code base enough to find it, because in 2005, someone added an XXX. What the heck is this at the end? We should really look at, uh, look at this other thing and figure out why this is here. And the answer is pure sloppiness. And it was still there until today in our code base where we deleted the buff. 
So this is the level of maintenance in the OpenSSL. Okay. Um, you might have seen the lols over the web page. Uh, I, when we announced the name, I put up a web page. Uh, if you've looked at the OpenSS, OpenBSD web pages, you'll probably note that we uh, kind of uh, don't spend a lot of time on web design. We're sort of old fashioned, and uh, we like web pages to have information on them, not dancing baloney. And we don't spend a lot of time worrying about what font we use, what colors we use, or anything else. So I, I was just going to do this in 10 minutes on my couch, because Theo had said, yeah, let's just get the name out, so I had the domains. I sat down on my couch, and I started copying over the OpenSSH page. I was just going to delete the OpenSSH logo, put all the same info on it, and done. There's a placeholder page we can announce the name. And I realized, like everything else we announced to the broader community, immediately the web design Nazis get on our case and say, our web pages suck. Please help. Oh, we'll help you. Can we volunteer to redesign your page with Flash and CSS and Dancing Baloney and, and Google Cloud and uh, just whatever. Um, so I decided if they were going to, uh, uh, if I was going to get complaints about it and idiots volunteering to write web pages instead of fixing code, uh, I was going to make the complaints justified. And I just made this horrible page with Comic Sans solid and a blink tag and put it at the bottom. <laughs> this page scientifically designed to annoy web hipsters. Donate now. I think we've gotten about $40,000 in donations. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I won't complain. Uh, but uh, I was, uh, somebody said I was the first person to ever have weaponized Comic Sans. Uh, uh, I will put that on my CV somewhere. Uh, but I'm actually quite sad that a lot more people out there in this world will spend time on the internet bitching about Comic Sans being used on a web page, and yet they're doing this over machines that are running, for example, the ASIN1 code, which if you want to go look at something horrific, go look at the ASN1 code inside OpenSSL. It's, it's, there's something wrong with the world. Uh, <laughs> okay, so, somebody asked about how much has gone. 101G was a 380,000-line code base. About uh, we've deleted slightly over I, I, We've actually deleted more than ninety. I think we've deleted about a hundred thousand, but we've added more back in. So the actual difference right now is about ninety because we've added some stuff. Okay, um, it's about a fa half a million line diff from one point oh one G. So if you actually run diff minus U on both trees, the result is about a half a million lines. That much has changed. Okay, the cleaning can. Lots of bugs have been fixed. Uh, the cleaning continues, but uh, we have started adding some new features, new ciphers, and the code's become a lot more readable. Um, we've continued to update the crypto. Uh, my list is a little bit out. Uh, it's been very successful. We've added a bunch of cipher suites, Brainpool, uh, ChaCha, Poly1305, ASIN, FRP01, uh, and a bunch of new cipher suites for SSL based on the above. So we support cipher suites that are not supported in OpenSSL 101G. Some of them came from later, not yet released versions of OpenSSL. Some of this code came from other authors, okay, who have given us or licensed versions of that code to us under favorable licenses that we can include. Um, the FIPS mode is gone. Coming back. Uh, I do believe OpenSSL is basically operating as a FIPS consultancy. It says it's a foundation, but it's incorporated as a for-profit company in Maryland. Um, it's actively harmful to the security library, and there's enough room in the ecosystem for other uh, implementations. Uh, if people needing to be the U.S. government need FIPS, they should run open SSL. Don't run open SSL. Um, but having said that, the non-intrusive stuff, okay, which is, for instance, other government-mandated ciphers, are welcome. Okay. Lots of places around the world say, you need to use this cipher for government business. And maybe that cipher isn't necessarily cryptographically all that wonderful, maybe people have issues with it. We don't care, as long as it, it's provided to us with a clean implementation and under an acceptable license, we'll include it. Okay? So, uh, things like Camilla in Japan, Gost in Russia, the ASIN1 FRP curve that we actually included is a French el government elliptic curve which some cryptographers think might not be all that great, but the point is it's not on by default, right? And now, if somebody actually has to do business with the French government, instead of having their code look like, if big gross hacks to include my own crap, otherwise call standard API, they can just say, oh, turn on the French government mandated cipher and call standard API. 
that's going to be way less buggy in code out there that we would all potentially have to run. So we believe it's better for people to need to use this, to have the same library with the same API instead of trying to roll their own. Because they'll introduce bugs that end up, then end up getting put back in software, that gets put back in the ecosystem and we all have to eat. Okay? We don't want that. Okay? So what will you need to run a portable version, maybe, when we release it? When we get one together? In an essentially modern POSIX-like environment, uh, who knows out there what's POSIX? Mostly Unix, right? What platforms aren't POSIX these days? No, wrong! Windows has a fantastic POSIX compatibility layer. You can make anything POSIX work on Windows with a little bit of effort. Is it supported? Huh? Who gives a shit? Is OpenSSL supported? People run it on Windows, it ain't supported. <laughs> okay. Um, the OS has to provide a good source of random data, and this is probably the biggest trip up. Okay? If your OS does not provide a good source of random data, its readiness and quality are the responsibility of the OS, not LibreSSL. And by readiness, I mean when you start running an application that needs random entropy, it better be available. It better not fail. It better not block when you don't want it to. Okay? And there are still problems with this on a number of mainstream operating systems. That, for instance, don't expose random data as a system call that won't fail, but make you open a device that will. Or that an attacker can make fail. Okay? So there's still issues with this in places in the ecosystem out there. Okay? Which? Half-hazard. I didn't do that. Oh, half-hazard. Half-hazard. English language. I refuse to fix it. I like this stuff. Yeah, right. It's, it's, it's good for that. Okay? Mo modern C-string capabilities, malloc-free realloc with proper overflow checking in calloc, explicit B0 and realloc array. We've seen gross ports already. People said, I have Libre SSL for Linux. And what have they done? Linux doesn't have ARC4 random, so they've made ARC4 random be random. Get the ID. Think that's super secure? They didn't have explicit B0. They didn't know what explicit B0 was. So they just found to find explicit B0 and B0. What is explicit? Explicit B0 is a function wrapped around B0 so that GCC will not optimize out the B0 call when we exit a function. So that when it says, hi, I've used your key, now zero it out of memory. Oh, well, I didn't need to do that. You were returning anyway. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Okay? It's very important. Okay? And these people doing these, ha these stupid little, oh, I got it to compile ports, are taking that away. They're providing crappy randomness. They're turning strl copy into stir copy, because you can. It'll compile. We don't care. All right? Fun stuff like that. So, we want people to work with us on portability to understand our processes, understand security, and understand the library. They understand why these functions are being used the way they're used and where they're used. They are not just a porter, somebody who just makes shit compile and doesn't understand what's going on under the covers. What about those STRL functions? Are they widely available now? They're everywhere. Uh, almost every piece of portable software has... The, okay, first of all, they're in every Unix libc except for glibc on Linux. They're in the alternate libc's for Linux. And just about every piece of free software out there includes a copy of them with itself because Linux doesn't include them. Hmm. Yeah, let's put it this way. They're on your, all of your phones. <laughs> your phones have them. doesn't have SDL CPY. Yeah. Android and... and uh, uh, Apple phones all have it. So, longer term goals, provide a re better replace reduced API, reduce the code pace even more, possibly long term, split out non-crypto things from libcrypto. Libcrypto is this whale, okay? Remember I said about 20% of the code is crypto, the rest of it is compatibility layer and goo, some of it is gross replacements for libc that should never been in there, uh, some of it is just conversion stuff, passing stuff back and forth, or stuff to encapsulate a key in a certificate. It's really not crypto. Okay. It'd be nice to get some of that stuff separated when we could change the API. And split libcrypto out from libssl so you didn't actually have to have the two of them together. Okay. Which right now you do. 
The challenge is, of course, the extensive public API, as I mentioned, and it needs to be reduced and modernized as the ecosystem adopts. We can't just change stuff in here and expect everybody to change their software overnight. We have to become more visible, we have to see our changes out there, we have to be incorporated in other places, and then we can start pushing for API change. Uh, some of the major pieces should really be rewritten completely. Uh, the ASN1 code that's in there is Every time four or five of us dive into it, we run away screaming. Uh, we, 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 we do gorilla fixes in it. We go in there, we, we put on the, the, the ski mask and the gloves and the armor, stick the guns and swords to our back, dive into the code base, fix a few things and get out before it sucks us in. Because it's really, really awful. And while as in one as a protocol is pretty awful, um, the implementation is, makes it a lot worse. And really, somebody who is dedicated to such a thing really needs to completely make a nice new as and one implementation. And time and resources, essentially money. Okay. Um, so what are we looking for? We're poking the community. We're poking co corporations. We're looking for funding commitment to probably sponsor several developers, key developers. We have people in mind to rewrite some key pieces of the code base, like this as and one stuff. These are people we know, a lot of them work for places. We'd like to be able to be able to fund them to take a sabbatical from where they're working and do this for us. Okay? Because it's not something that a volunteer can just take on. It's too much work. It needs that dedicated time. Uh, we'd like to sponsor some of the efforts of the portability people to keep track of the effects of changes through the ports tree and push those changes upstream. They're doing an awful lot of work to do that right now and helping us out. So we're looking for a significant funding commitment for a couple of years to help us speed this up. Okay? We want to speed the rewrite of the library, but we do not want to do it at the expense of our usual resources to maintain OpenBSD, OpenSSH, and regular projects. And, and those are somewhat meager as it is. Um, yes, we've asked the Linux, and everybody, and the, the comment is there, and three reporters misquoted me on it, so if you misquote me on it, I'll find you and strangle you. <laughs> that does not say the Linux Foundation has ignored us. They have not ignored us. I've been in communication with the Linux Foundation with their core infrastructure initiative, which is to support things that are important to the internet and are used by a lot of operating systems. They have a bunch of major donors. Uh, they have not yet committed to support Neighbor SSL. They have also not said no. Okay? There's obviously some political issues. And they've said they need a little time to deal with it. And they have a request from me. They know what they what we want to do. And they are considering it. Okay? But we don't have that commitment yet. And so frankly, we want sponsorship. So if employers would be interested, that's the address to mail. Okay. Summary. It's awful. <coughs> we need it fixed with effort, with a lot of effort. We've cleaned it up a lot, and we have a very good start on it. Um, there's still some big pieces that might need some thorough world retailing. Some of the more, what used to be horrible pieces are only mildly terrifying now and are actually <laughs> readable. Um, you laugh when I say mildly terrifying. We have a running joke in OpenBSD about some of the more horrible parts of our tree, particularly things like uh, some of the, I'll say some of the lovely turds that I like to find and roll in because it's some of the things that I do in OpenBSD. Which is like pieces of our kernel that do NFS uh, and uh, file system soft dependencies and buffer cache. The file system soft dependency code is, is interesting and arcane. Uh, but while this is going on, you know, somebody found a soft debt bug and I waltzed into soft debt and fixed the bug. And it's like, oh my god, this is wonderful. It's lovely code. And, and literally people thought I was nuts. Because okay? <laughs> normally I just swear about this whole mess. And it was just. So wonderful to be back in code that was nice. trying, to right <laughs> trying to do the right thing instead of code that was just so badly broken, so badly trying to do the wrong thing. And so we do know where we want to go with this, and we want to bring the rest of the community with us. So support us, help us out publicly, and uh, thank you. That's it. Bye. Modern C code incorporates use of modern, safe string manipulation techniques, yeah. modern, safe ways of dealing with the sizes of values, uh -huh. 
Um, it does not do things like assume that arguments are implicitly declared or that they exist just because they're there. Oh, wow. Uh, it does not do things like... Oh, <laughs> okay, it's time for Malak 1 story. <laughs> it does not do things like, oh, we have an amount to allocate, which might be zero. And so we're going to allocate it, and we're going to, if malloc fails, we're going to return error message. So what we do, of course, is we say, if the amount to allocate is zero, pointer equals malloc1. If otherwise, pointer equals malloc real size. If there's a null fight, null error, if, the, if it's null, puke. Well, why do we malloc1? Oh, so there won't be a null pointer there. It's stupid! It's very old school. Malloc didn't used to be able to handle zero. Yes. Malloc now can allocate zero and is required to return either null or a pointer. In OpenBSD, we have a very, very cool malloc that actually returns unwritable memory. Yeah, if you malloc zero, you get a, you get a real pointer, but it's unwritable. Oh, cute. Okay. okay. But malloc zero was not supported but doesn't malloc in KNR. Doesn't Malik Kurt, Kurt Hannah Ritchie, so before the yeah. days of ANSI CDN. But now he gives you, if you Malik zero, you get a null pointer. You, you don't know what you're going to get. Yeah, you could get. Can't use it. It could be. It could be. You don't, you don't use Malik null zero will work. The call will work, yes. but you don't know what you're going to get. I, oh, you, you don't get the null pointer. You don't, you don't know what you're going to get. Okay. Okay. Maybe it's an undefined behavior. It's undefined behavior. Oh, if you can't R, it's undefined behavior. But still, if you free a null pointer, that's a null. No, yeah, free null is legal. Yes, right. No, that's what I mean. It's benign. Yeah. Benign. Yeah. Um, so, how do you handle uh, situations where the OpenSSL documentation says something like always returns one, but the code clearly is not always one? Well, and that's like <laughs> BIOS and printf. It, oh, it says it's this, yeah, and it is this, but they're not using it that way. Uh, our way of handling this is to say, this whole function is stupid, we should never use it. We've converted the entire library to not use that function, to use the intrinsic, with the proper checking. Okay. We've left the old one there, and in that particular case, it's marked deprecated, which will just generate a compiler warning, and we'll look for things that use it. So, so then, uh, you would be assuming that uh, you're going with the document? Well, no. We're going with a different function, okay? Their function is, is bio SN printf, messed up SN printf. Our function is SN printf. We convert the entire library to use SN printf the way SN printf is supposed to be used. We don't use the broken function. We leave the broken function there for API control, <coughs> and we start looking for bad broken things that use it. So is bio control dead now? No, 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 you're thinking of something, you're, you're barking up the wrong tree. Okay. This is not biocontrol. You're thinking of an OpenBSD function that is completely unrelated to what I said. Bio is a piece of OpenSSL. It just happens to have the same name. Okay. Yeah. yeah what, um, how much money would it take to fix all the problems? My guess to get us off the ground quickly and cleanly with the rewrite of the pieces we want is approximately 200 grand for two years. So 400k. 400k. Or 200 for two years. Why has the Canadian government ever do? Uh, well, I applied to. Well, does does it does uh? Well, I don't know. Is that the government? NRC. No, no, not NRC. Uh, um, uh, uh, why why am I drawing blank? The .ca net folks. Sierra. Sierra. Is that the government? No. No. no it's not government supported. Government. Well, I applied for them for a grant. They said no. So they have more worthy projects. Have you tried Canada Revenue, though? No. No? No? Have an ask. Have an ask. If you, guys, if you guys have contacts at those places, please ask them. Please direct them to that email. This one. That's not a bad idea. They got all the headlines. But if you've got the contacts, send them there. Help us. Hmm? Well, the website actually changed. I took the blink. I decided 40 grand was enough. I took the blink tag off. <laughs> you should put up the thing I'm putting the link tag back on if you don't donate it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so although we actually like Comic Sans, we have a long tradition of using Comic Sans in our presentations 
just because Magic Point, this junky piece of software we like to use, traditionally came with three fonts, like Times, some other thing, and Comic Sans. And uh, Times doesn't work on a projector, it's too thin. Comic Sans is the only but font it's that's very readable. readable. <laughs> yeah, it's not readable on a projector. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's readable on paper, not on a projector. So Bob, how are yep. things going with YY? Uh, well, I wouldn't know. I'm not on the board. I have not been on the board since their annual general meeting you, in November. What do you hear? Well, I know what I hear when I, as the OpenBSD Foundation director, ask for pricing for connectivity because I want to actually, we actually now have money yes. granted to us by somebody to get the project hooked up to uh, better internet connectivity proper. Right. And uh, when I asked for pricing, uh, it was clear to me that there was absolutely no agreement between the data center and YYCIX uh, because I couldn't get both sides to commit to what the rules were. Between data hive? Data hive? Yeah, I could not get data hive to answer me. So, 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 what, what is, uh... so anyway, after, after two or three days of trying to get data hive to answer me, I basically said, guys, stop wasting effort on this because I will not connect. So the foundation will not connect to YWCNX because I can't. I cannot trust what's going on in Data Hive. I'm not going to spend twenty or thirty thousand dollars of donated money for a fiber build out to a data center that can't give me pricing and can't be trusted to keep their agreement. Mm -hmm. I, it's, it's, I, I, I would be, I would be irresponsible in my position as a director if I spent money to do that. So it'll go somewhere. Sure. That's all I can say about why we see it. Okay. Anything else you'll have to ask why we see it? Do I understand? Theo? <laughs> <laughs> we, I, not my problem. problem. There are problems. We're trying to work around them. Yeah. Okay. We're trying to do we're we're to. Okay. What, what, your, what are your thoughts on the Blackberry electric curve patterns? I haven't literally looked. Okay. Honest to God, I haven't. I don't have a Blackberry. Um, I have dealt with enough. Looking through this code base, I've dealt with enough moribund, ready-to-die platforms for a lifetime. I don't need to acquire a BlackBerry. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, I mean, just in this building, you know, as people keep your, your water and sewer going, uh, rather the white-collar people who think they keep your water and sewer going. don't keep my water and sewer going. I live in Edmonton. Yeah, yeah. No, it just doesn't go. No. Um, <laughs> Um, <laughs> of the white collar workers, the ones who don't actually keep it going, those are the guys in the trucks. I bet 80% are uh, concerned with developing more Calgary, with plugging in new subdivisions of Calgary every year, and only about 20% actually keep the existing system running. Mm -hmm. There's just sort of more honors and applause go to those people who build new highway interchanges and new water treatment plants and those who keep existing ones running. Now, you apply that code, which you seem to be saying applies here, is that maintenance just isn't sexy and exciting and doesn't attract You're absolutely right. Right? You hit it on the head. Which implies that any old piece of code is a steaming pile of space tourists. No, it depends. There are a lot of people who keep old pieces of code up to date. There are a number of all old pieces of code that were just written well. You know what? Just because it's old doesn't mean it's crap. Mm. It might have been written well in the first place and that's okay. But what tends to happen is, is particularly when you're, you're trying to maintain this spaghetti mess of portability, you put in something as a temporary fix. Oh, here's a temporary fix. Here's a temporary fix. XXX should go away after the release we made 14 years ago. XXX, somebody should figure this out. Uh, you know, all of this crap that's in there and why, it, somebody would have to do unglamorous scut work. Guess what we've been doing? To go through and actually delete stuff. Okay, and it's a problem, it, it is a widespread problem in a lot of code bases, though. It, it, you know, they, there's a saying it takes heroes to delete code. Okay? And it because it's hard. Okay? It's harder, it's easier to write new code than it is to delete old code. Because you have no idea what the hell you're gonna break. Okay? It's easier to work around. And it's very hard to delete old code cleanly. And so a lot of times when the hero isn't there, the workarounds go in and the old code never goes away. So it's, it's, it's a big problem. Probably a lot, lot like an old um, old house. Fixing an old house is a lot more trouble than uh, building a yeah, new well, house. Yeah, well, and, and, and I, I would say it's probably, if, if you talk about what attracts and retains developers at OpenBSD, in spite of the fact that we have this <coughs> network-wide reputation for being abrasive apps,
outside, trying to apply exactly the same principle throughout our entire source tree. Outsiders are showing up and suddenly flooding us with changes to apply the same principle. So that the best current practice is going to become the only current practice. Which is good. The, the ecosystem is designed to consider that tremendous value. The developing community considers that tremendous value. And so it's the communities sometimes, some communities can produce code bases that become better, cycle by cycle by cycle. And other communities sort of hit a wall and can't. But it's, it's nothing to do with the code base. It has to do with the community. It's the people, it's the mindset, it's about, you know, what's the word. You, you want to test it open via few people off, import something from upstream, and then we fix it, and go work. We'll keep that one private for now, but, yeah. but the fact is is that, that, that really it's about the people and it is a mindset and it is a culture. And OpenBSD, the community and OpenBSD and the security people value that cleaning. Okay? What have I, you know, I've been going to conferences and getting all this exposure, giving a talk like this. I'm, I'm writing very little new code. I'm deleting crap. I'm writing tiny